So we've talked a lot about you know, what's going on in the markets last year, and a lot of this presentation is going to focus on the stock market. But you know, we're hearing more and more lately, especially in the news and financial news, that word recession. So let's take a look really where we're at today with regard to the economic cycle. So we're going to go over current economic strength. I mean, we just had the December jobs report come out a couple weeks ago, created over 300,000 jobs. I mean, 10 years into a recovery cycle, that's fantastic. For the year, we created over um, 2 million jobs. And when you look at it, I want to look historically, you know, how this job creation compares to recessionary times. And the recessions in a lot of these charts are going to be these, these gray bars um, that go up and down for the whole graph. And every time in the past, we've seen job growth coming down and leading into a recession. We're looking today, you know, it's been somewhat flat over the past few years, but we're still creating more jobs than ever before. And it's trending up, and we haven't seen that trending up any time leading into a recession in the past. Let's look at GDP growth. I mean, the theme for a lot of the recovery was this new normal. We were talking about the new normal and what that meant because we were only seeing you know, 2 percent GDP growth for a lot of the recovery, which is really low, historically um, speaking. You know, the last year, we've actually sort of broken out of that phase. We've gotten more into 3 percent, maybe a little over 3 percent. And again, when you go back over time, every time, same thing here with these gray bars representing recessions, we've seen GDP growth really coming down. We haven't seen it on an uptrend. We've seen it on a downtrend. So right now, in our current economic uh, environment, we're seeing an uptrend in GDP growth. That's good. That's showing us that you know, it doesn't feel as though we're, we're heading towards a recession right now. Corporate efficiency. I mean, you go back over the last 30 years or so, Again, every time heading into a recession, you're seeing corporate efficiency going down. Right now, corporate efficiency is very strong, stronger than we've seen over the last 30 years, and it's really trending up at a pretty sharp pace. We're not seeing the weakness in corporate efficiencies, and what that's shown us, too, is that at higher profit margins, we're keeping up with this earnings growth. We saw the slide earlier where earnings growth for 2018 was very strong, just investors weren't willing to pay as much for it. But right now, corporate corporations are operating efficiently. Earnings are up. Earnings are still growing, maybe not at the same rate as we saw last year, but still up in high single digits. So this is a positive. And again, the trend line going up is a good thing versus what we've seen historically heading into the last two recessions. Corporate debt. You know, you hear we get a lot of clients or a lot of questions from clients asking about, you know, corporate debt seems to be rising. And, you know, what happens, especially as interest rates rise. Now that corporate debt payment is going to be a little bit more expensive. You know, how are they going to be able to maintain that? Well, if you go again over the past 50 years or so, you know, we're trending up in terms of what the net debt versus um, these companies, let's just call it cash flow, their EBITDA. So what their net debt is versus their cash flow, it's still actually below the past 50 year average. It is rising, and you know, you think about, well, higher rates, it's going to be harder for them to pay off their debts. Well, we've seen rates rise. We've seen uh, the, the uh, Federal Reserve increase short-term interest rates, but long-term rates have, they rose pretty quickly at the start of last year, but they've sort of stabilized, and they're back, you know, under two, more in the 2.8% range. So, you know, it's not a given that rates are going to take off from here, especially longer-term rates. And like I said, when you look at it, corporate debt is still probably more closer to uh, historical averages than being way out of whack. Household debt, again, you know, something we talk about a lot. You hear it in the news, especially as it relates to student loans. I mean, that's on the rise. Um, you hear car default rates uh, going up. And so there's that worry that, you know, we saw problems in the um, consumer debt market back in 07, 08 with the housing crisis. You know, how does this compare? You know, in our minds, when you talk about student debt, um, car loans defaulting, you know, it's nothing to, you know, brush to the side because especially student debt and how much uh, college is costing these days, I mean, that is a substantial debt burden, especially the younger generation. Um, but when you look at this, what we're showing is household debt as a percentage of their disposable income. And when you go back over the last 30 years, I mean, we are really at the lowest level that we've been in the last 30 years. So we are concerned about some of these, you know, student debt, uh, car loan defaults, but it's not an apples-apples comparison to, say, 
the housing crisis back in 07 and 08. So again, we're watching it, but when you look at this as debt service payments as a percentage of disposable income, it's very positive right now for uh, consumers in, in the overall economy. And you think about consumer makes up about 70% of the overall economy. So this is a good sign as well. In inflation, I mean, the fear the last year, year and a half has always been as the economy starts to rise, starts to heat up, you know, there's fear of inflation picking up. And the fear of inflation picking up is because now the Fed has to raise interest rates. And when we've looked at the, you know, the last, let's say, five, 10 years, I mean, inflation has sort of been leveled out at around two. Right now it's at 2.2%. So even with the growth, three, over 3% GDP growth, our inflation rates are staying pretty muted and it gives less need for the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates. So this is a positive in terms of what the Fed may do throughout the rest of the year. So there's a lot of good. We've talked about the strength of the current economy. But as we're looking at you know, some other things, whether in the US or globally, there are certainly some concerns with what's going on in the economy as well. So let's look at this. We asked beforehand, again, we, uh, we threw out an email to ask for questions before the presentation so we could sort of work them into the overall presentation. One of the questions we received was, you know, the bond yield continues to flatten. History shows that recessions often occur after the slope turns negative. What is your opinion of why the bond curve is flattening at this time? And it's something that, you know, it's been talked a lot about this year and certainly something to be concerned with if you look at a historical basis. I have two slides within this section that we'll look at and discuss a little bit about what's going on with the yield curve. Let's look at corporate spending. You know, if you look at corporate spending, which is this green line here, you know, we've had the corporate tax cut last year, which should really, you know, bo it boosted companies' bottom lines. We've had sort of a muted capital expenditure um, environment for corporations for a long time. We would have thought that corporate tax cuts strengthened the economy, would, would really would have seen this line sort of trend upwards at this point. We saw it rise pretty sharply, you know, 16, 17, somewhat into 2018, but we're sort of seeing it, you know, crest off right here. Whether or not that's gonna be a long-term trend, be interesting to see, but certainly something to be concerned with that it's slowing down just after we've cut corporate tax rates. Unemployment and wages. So you look at this chart and you're seeing unemployment come down. It's down at 3.9%. It was at 3.7%. Um, it only came up because more people are joining the workforce. So you, know, you look at this chart and you're saying, well, this is a good thing for the economy. We're creating more jobs, um, less unemployment, higher wages. That's all a positive, right? Well, if you look at the last two recessions, you know, you go back to 2000 and you go back to uh, 2007, 2008, you know, when those numbers come close or overlap, and we're getting closer, we're at 3.9% unemployment, 3.2% wage growth, we've actually seen a recession when those numbers come together. So again, it is a positive in terms of the trend of what's happening. But historically, that's sort of been a sign to point to potential recessionary uh, factors. Global earnings. So again, I mean, we've had times when global earnings has slowed down, even during this recovery, even when the market's going up. You look at 2014, 2015, you know, you're seeing all of them start to trend down a little bit in different instances. Right now, though, you know, we're seeing all these. We have the U.S., we have emerging markets, we have Japan, and we have Europe. So we really have the global economy here. And we're seeing a trend just recently that they're all, again, cresting sort of at the same time, and which sort of makes sense. I mean, you think about U.S. large cap companies, they derive almost 50% of their earnings overseas. So if you see some slowdowns globally, it may trickle into the U.S. economy as well. And I do think it's something worth looking at. Again, will it be a long-term trend? It's hard to tell because it's just starting to um, show itself now. But you know, when you look back, the last time that happened was around 08, 09. Um, it's something that, again, we're going to be watching pretty closely going forward. Um, this is our you know, global heat map. So essentially what this is showing, it's the PMI index. Globally, what happens, there's a survey that goes out to manufacturing companies. And what they're really, you know, in the simplest form is, is your business growing or is it shrinking? And so any number over 50 means that on average it's growing. Any number under 50, it's showing that it's shrinking. And this goes for the global economy. It has developed markets, emerging markets. The US, it breaks it out by every different country. 
And during 2017 into 2018, we had a very good, green, solid growth numbers. Again, we're still on a global scale. We're at 51.5. We're still showing signs of growth, but that growth is starting to slow down. You're seeing some trends, maybe a little bit more yellow versus the dark green, you know, a little um, orange, even into red. So that's a sign that, again, sometimes these will happen. Is it going to be a long-term trend? We'll continue to watch it, but you are seeing a little bit of a slowdown globally. And here's the flattening and or inverted yield curve. Again, this was a big topic this past year. Right now, we're at about 20 basis points, so 0.2% between. And what the flattening yield curve is measuring is what the 10-year Treasury is yielding versus the two-year Treasury. And as the Fed continues to raise short-term rates, that two-year Treasury number is getting closer and closer to the 10-year Treasury number. We didn't invert this year, but we've gotten very close at times. And we're getting closer now. It's at, like I said, it's at about 0.2%. And if you look at the past seven recessions over the last 60 years or so, every recession had an inverted yield curve just before it happened. Now, you know, it, it varies. It, sometimes it was 19 months before. Sometimes it was nine months. The average is about 14 months be before. So it's been a pretty good indicator it, that we may be heading towards a recession. We've also had two times back here in 98 and again, you know, in the 60s where we had an inverted yield curve that didn't directly um, result in a recession. So it's not 100%, and that's what's always important to remember with any of this data. You know, they bringing up as a talking point of a sign of incoming recession, but you have to take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. And so let's look at what's driving this flattening yield curve. And, you know, I'm going to focus on the U.S., Germany, Japan, the U.K., and Italy. And we're just going to look at the 10-year yield for each of those countries' government bonds. You look at the U.S., it's about 2.8. Germany, 0.25. Japan is at zero. The U.K., 1.2. And Italy is the only thing that's close to the U.S. at 2.76. Now, if someone had to ask you, you know, you're going to lock up your money for 10 years. What country are you choosing? Are you going to choose Italy over the United States right now with everything that's going on there? Probably not. And so when you look at all these countries, the United States, even though it's at a historically low level, it has the best yield and most secure yield across the globe. And so this chart on the bottom, the yellow line here is showing the trend of that 10-year Treasury um, yield. It's been going down. What this white chart line shows over the last 15, 20 years or so is the um, demand for U.S. Treasury notes. In, in you know, basic economic terms, as that demand rises, that keeps prices low. And so this is a big reason why you're seeing some of the long-term notes staying low. It is more, you know, you, you see the history of the recessionary factors, but is it driven because we're headed towards a recession or is there a supply and demand issue at play? In looking at this chart, you know, it does show that that outside demand is keeping those uh, long-term rates lower than maybe they would be otherwise. And so this is a chart of leading indicators. This comes from Charles Schwab. Um, you know, leading indicators are economic factors that start to show themselves sort of before the full economy. And when you look currently, you know, it talks about average work weeks, uh, unemployment claims, the S&P 500, interest rate spread. You know, for the most part right now, it's either strong or fair. There's not a ton of concerns at the moment. But when you look here and at what all these are trending towards, it's not as rosy of a picture. More stable, some improving, only two of the 11, but some are worsening, some are, some are stabilizing. So again, this isn't a 100% um, indicator of what's happening, but it's good to see sort of what the trend is here. And so, you know, we look at the good in the economy, we look at the bad, you know, potential factors that aren't so good in the economy. You know, what does this mean for 2019 as investors? Well, I want to highlight to you, you know, as we head towards late stage bull markets, and, you know, we don't know exactly where we are right now, but we are, you know, 10 years into a recovery cycle. Probably if you had to put your money on it, you're probably on the latter half than the first half of it. Um, and you look 24 months before the peak of a bull market. The S&P has been up 41%. 12 months before, the S&P has historically been up 23%. Six months prior, 15%. Three months prior, S&P has been up 8%. And all this shows is that 
you know, we always talk about how hard it is to time markets. And the thing to remember is that even if you feel you are towards a later stage bull market, a lot of times there's a lot of gains to be had. So, you know, you want to be concerned with what's going on and, and weigh it, but you don't want to make too drastic of decisions. But on the flip side, you know, heading into recessions, what do you typically see? So we're going to talk a little bit about how the stock market and the economy are two separate things. And so, you know, 12, six months leading into a recession, the stock market's been down five and a half percent. Historically, 12 months out, the stock market's been down one percent. So what that's showing us is that, again, the stock market isn't exactly the economy. They are a little bit different. And so how do we weigh that? Well, right here, this is just a textbook definition of what is the market cycle and what's the economic cycle. And as you can see, this blue here, that's the you know, textbook definition of a market cycle. It usually precedes what the peak is for a economic cycle. Now, this green, there's a ton of overlap. Its majority is overlap, but they aren't always on the same time frame. And this is just a real world example. You go back again about 60 years, all these gray bars are previous recessions, seven of them. And you can see the red lines are the stock market peak before those recessions. Again, it's probably in the range of 14 to 10 months before um, that recession occurred. Really the only time they happened just about the same time was 2007 and that was, you know, as we all experienced, was certainly a unique time period. You know, I think the best real world consideration when you think about this is, you know, what is the future 12 month stock return at given uh, unemployment rates? And I just want to focus on the left side of this bar chart. You know, right here shows the, you know, next 12 month historical returns when we're below 4.4 in the unemployment rate. Historically, it's been the lowest, you know, next year return cycle. So that just shows you, even though we could be in a great strong economy, there may be some concerns with the stock market. So we want to weigh all those things as we make our investment decisions. You know, real quick, quickly, you know, I just highlighted right here, this is just a 60-40 portfolio over the last 20 years ending 2017 versus what they, what they say average investor. What it really measures is inflows, outflows of mutual funds. And what it highlights is how difficult it is to time markets. Because when you see people getting out of the market, usually it's at the wrong time. And when you see people getting more into it, again, it tends to be at the wrong time. So after the last 20 years, if you measured those inflows and outflows, the average yearly return was 2.6%. If you just bought and hold a 60-40 portfolio without doing much more than rebalancing, you're up 6.4%. Over a 20-year period, the difference of $100,000 value at the start is almost $200,000 difference future. So it's important that you know, we have these different cycles but it is, you have to be a long-term investor. We can't time these things because it's really hard to do. And the last slide I wanna leave you with is, you know, when you're talking about historical bull and bear markets, all this blue here is bull markets. All this orange red is bear markets. Over the last 90 years, the average bear market has been about 14 months on average. Average bull market, it's been about nine years. When you see what the growth in those bull markets versus the downturns in the bear markets, it's a huge difference. There's a lot more growth in those bull markets. So, you know, again, when we're making investment decisions, we want to be aware of what's going on, you know, in the current economy, maybe the future economy, but we don't want to overreact because if we overreact too much for these short periods of times and the downturn, we miss this huge substantial growth on the upswing. And so in summary of what we've talked about, current economy is strong. We don't feel we're in a recession today. There are recessionary concerns starting to creep up, mostly in the global economy, but we are seeing some in the US. There's potential for it, maybe in the next six to 24 months, but again, almost impossible to time these things, but we're watching all the data that I shared with you tonight. We know from that chart, we can't time markets here, but what we can do is we can make systematic changes to the portfolio to capture upswings and downswings in the market. And lastly, you know, right now with everything that's going on, it's not a time to overreact. And so with all of that in the economy, I'm going to turn it over to Marty Shields. He's going to share a little bit more about what we're talking and discussing with on the portfolio side and the stock market side.